Hey, this is Tuck Stull from Kalamazoo College with our final um, video on intellectual property law. And this one is looking at trademarks. Um, so protecting a very different kind of um, IP. I'd like to continue our discussion of intellectual property law by looking at trademarks. Trademarks protect symbols. So the Golden Arches, Big Mac, Crayola, um, right, these are all protected by trademarks. And trademarks are really protected for a different reason than uh, patents or copyrights. There's nothing um, distinctly uh, creative about trademarks, but what we're doing with trademarks is providing information. Right? providing information to the consumer about who produced this good. Um, right? And trademarks are essentially about identity as opposed to about creativity. So trademarks um, can be registered uh, with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And so if you see a, um, a little R with a circle, uh, next to a brand name. Uh, that's a federal registry. Uh, but trademarks can also be claimed through use uh, without registration. Uh, this would be a common law trademark, and those may be marked with a TM for trademark. Trademark protection doesn't expire. It doesn't have a specific term like a patent or a uh, trademark. So it could last forever as long as the company using it uh, lasts forever. Like the other forms of intellectual property, uh, these rights can be transferred, they can be bought and sold, they can be given away, they can be licensed. Uh, so frequently we see um, uh, licensing to show that something meets standards. Um, so on uh, tooth toothpaste um, it, packaging, it's fairly common to see an ADA trademark um, showing that it meets the um, standards, the quality standards of the American Dental Association. Or we might see on certain kinds of food a uh, U encircled, uh, which would show that that food meets the kosher standards of the Union of, um, of Rabbis. And so those would be just some examples of licensing. Uh, but we could have other ones where the whole, a whole brand name is licensed or the whole trademark is licensed. Now, the important thing about trademarks is that the protection here is very narrow. Right? The marks themselves need to be specific and recognizable. Uh, generic names cannot be trademarked. So we seem to have, at least recently, uh, in our tech companies, right, the use of generic names in a lot of products, Google Photos, Apple Photos, again, neither of those are trademarkable. Um, and the protection is narrow enough that you can have companies using the same um, trademark for different products. So Delta is a well-known airline. Uh, but Delta is also a well-known maker of uh, plumbing fixtures, of faucets. Um, and so while these have exactly the same name and fairly sim uh, similar symbols, right? They're both triangles um, referencing the Greek Delta, I would imagine. Um, because there is little likelihood of confusion between the airline and the faucet manufacturer, both of these have valid trademarks um, using the same name. Trademarks don't really have the same uh, fair use that we might have in uh, copyrights, but the use might be a little bit more generous than in um, patents. Um, so competitors could use a trademark for competitive purposes so that uh, Pepsi could compare itself to Coke um, and use both of those brand names and logos in an advertisement. So let me come back and put a couple of 
um, footnotes in terms of lasting forever. It is possible for a name to become too famous. Um, and if a name becomes attached to a category as opposed to a specific company, a specific product, a specific brand, uh, it may lose its status as a trademark and just become a generic term, which um, those, of course, are not trademarkable. So Yo-Yo was a brand of um, Duncan uh, until it lost its trademark. Aspirin was a brand of Bayer Drug until it lost its trademark. Uh, Escalator was um, a brand of Otis. Again, it has become a generic name. Uh, similarly, Ping Pong was at one point a brand of table tennis as opposed to the generic name for table tennis in the United States. Uh, Dumpster was a uh, uh, brand owned by a particular company. Uh, and again, all of these and other um, names have become just ordinary words, no longer subject to trademark. There are um, several companies who are really concerned that their product or their brand has become so well known and so identified with um, a category that they are in danger of becoming generic. So brands like Kleenex, Velcro, Chapstick, um, Xerox, Frisbee, or Taser right, are all in danger of losing their trademark status. And so most of these companies will go to great effort to try and create a name uh, for the broader category, right? So it'll be Kleenex facial tissues, um, Velcro hook and loop fasteners, chapstick lip balm, Xerox copies, uh, Frisbee flying disc, and taser stun guns. And again, what they're trying to do is lose, is not lose the value uh, that they've invested in, uh, in those names. On the other hand, it is possible that companies simply walk away from trademarks when they don't feel that they are uh, valued any longer. Right? So abandoned trademarks do become available to be used by other companies. Uh, and typically a common law um, abandonment would be if a product hasn't been sold, has not been part of the market for more than three years and there is no intent to return it to the market, that that brand name, that trademark is no longer owned um, and it could be registered by another company. Um, of course, many of these trademarks are um, not well known, but here's one that is reasonably well known and this is the automobile LaSalle. Um, which was a fairly well-known type of car uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. Now, LaSalle became part of General Motors, um, and GM stopped selling uh, the LaSalle brand in the 1940s. Um, and they weren't marketing it. They didn't have um, at least public plans to use LaSalle. And a, another company called Aristide, which uh, collects um, historic brands and resells them, historic trademarks, uh, registered a trademark for the brand LaSalle. Um, General Motors saw that in 2008, um, challenged them, uh, and GM said, oh, we might want to bring it back in the, in the future, or we've licensed it in these certain ways uh, sometime since the 1940s, but the uh, court found in favor of the new registration, and so LaSalle uh, is available uh, if someone wants to buy it. And of course, that could be General Motors if they really did want to buy it. Um, right? But there are certainly um, cases where uh, trademarks have been abandoned and people have then picked them up and started uh, reselling the product or a new product under that trademark. One of the ways that companies protect their trademark, their investment in their identity, is by suing if they think someone is infringing or diluting their trademark. Uh, and Monster Cable, who makes expensive speaker uh, wires uh, and a variety of other um, audio equipment and audio uh, cables now, um, has become famous for suing um, anyone who uses the word monster in their name. So around 2006, they, sold, they sued 
a um, mini golf course called Monster Mini Golf, which um, apparently had uh, a very um, colorful monster theme. Uh, but they were sued by this cable company uh, for trademark infringement. Again, like the Delta and Delta example, there is no probability of confusion between these um, stereo components and um, this um, entertainment complex. Uh, and so there really was no grounds for the suit. Uh, it made a lot of press uh, back in the um, mid 2000s and Monster, did, uh, Monster Cable did drop the case. Um, although they then still tried to extract licensing fees from the mini golf company. Uh, in general, Monster was seen as an, uh, a trademark bully. Uh, they had an aggressive legal team who um, filed suits and filed cases with the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Offices against um, the job board Monster.com, against a um, hunting company that made, or hunting supply company that made a Monster uh, salt block, uh, against the Monster Energy Drink Company and against Disney for some products uh, with the Monsters Inc. label. Um, altogether, they brought over 200 complaints. Um, and as far as I can tell, none of those were um, successful, although they may have been able to extract some payments um, from companies who decided it was cheaper to, to pay them a small amount of money rather than to uh, continue the legal battle. Another part of trademark is what's known as trade dress. So trade dress is a subset of trademark law, uh, and it looks at the overall appearance or the total image, and in some cases this may be protected. Right, so we're looking at the combination of colors and shapes and typefaces or fonts, uh, essentially the look and feel of the product. Now, trade dress uh, or the overall um, image is less clear than a uh, word mark, than a name, uh, or than a logo. And it does need to meet um, three categories. It needs to be distinctive. It needs to be non-functional and consumers would need to be confused by the similar uh, look. Now this has been used um, and applied in a variety of different um, places. Um, so packaged goods, uh, restaurant designs, uh, insulation with the pink fiberglass getting its own protection, um, Reese's, um, which is a Hershey brand, uh, sued Mars, um, for dilution of their trademark, not because they were using the name, but because they were using um, a similar color combination. Uh, Mars, um, when they introduced their peanut butter M&Ms, experimented with a few different color packaging and settled in on a color that was um, very close to what Reese's had long been using for its peanut butter cups and also using for its Reese's pieces. Um, and so Reese's uh, was successful um, in blocking Mars from using those uh, particular packaging because it was too close to the overall look and feel. Um, a, another example of trade dress comes from high fashion, uh, high fashion where the red sole of the Christian Louboutin um, shoes uh, has successfully been defended as a trade dress. Um, no, not that um, no other shoe could use a red sole, but other fashion companies making um, high heels uh, would be in violation. So trade dress, um, the exact uh, protectability is still not particularly clear. Uh, and there certainly are uh, many cases that could be brought, uh, and it's unclear uh, is there infringement or not in those uh, particular cases. Let me end with another look at overreach, uh, and this is looking at Lego. So the Lego bricks 
um, were initially protected by a patent. Um, they were developed in Europe, and the uh, patent was granted in 1950 in the European Union um, and in 1961 in the United States. But again, patent lengths are limited, and so the patent on the Lego brick has long been expired. What the firm tried to do much more recently was to claim that the brick itself was a trademark of the company. And the uh, other firms that were producing compatible Legos, compatible bricks, um, right, were in violation of Lego's trademark on the, um, on the design. When it came to court, the decision was that the brick is functional, that those, um, the look and the pattern of the bricks makes them work, um, and it is not a symbol of the company, and moreover, that Lego can't use a trademark in order to create a perpetual monopoly, um, and that Lego had no further intellectual property uh, protection for its bricks, and that compatible um, bricks could be produced by other firms. So just because a company claims something doesn't necessarily mean that they really own it. Thanks for listening. This has been Chuck Stull from Kalamazoo College uh, for Law and Economics. I will see you in class and we will talk more about these kinds of issues.